our system of the last 15 years. Okay. Right. All right. Unless you have a reason why. No. No, I... Welcome to Berwick Academy's 214th commencement. Long as Fogg Memorial and the 1791 House has stood above Academy Street, the First Federated Church of South Berwick has stood longer. I'm pleased to introduce our good neighbor on Academy Street, Reverend Donna Lee Muse of the First Federated Church to offer the invocation. Will you pray with me, please? Holy and amazing God, you have brought forth from these young people a myriad of great talent, fine intellect, and creative responses to the world. As each young person crosses the stage and receives their diploma, we ask you to graduate them into a new level of service in their communities. <coughs> As the tassel is turned, may their visions and dreams always be turned toward you in a new relationship where they will be wonderfully empowered to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you. Amen. Please be seated. It seems only appropriate after one of the coldest winners on record, and after the coldest May on record, and after the wettest, or the third wettest May on record, that we would be out here uh, drenched in sweat on a hot, humid day. Uh, thank you all for coming uh, to this event and gracing this class in this way. Mr. Clement, Reverend Muse, colleagues, families, friends, and the class of 2005. We are gathered here today to celebrate the class of 2005 we are gathered to remember the class, remember the story of the class. The story is populated by wonderful and powerful stories. Kelsey Burke scoring two goals against Newton Country Day in two minutes. James Labby's three under, round, three under par round of golf at the ledges. Patrick Knowles' website for lacrosse. DeWitt Perkins organizing Wolfstock. Mikhail Mobius as Billy Joel playing New York State of Mind and entertaining the cast of The Mousetrap. Edmund McDonald scoring the winning goal against the Brooks School, the third ranked team in New England, with six seconds left. Sarah Fink taking her athleticism off campus to the horse world, winning top equitation rider for the 15 to 17 year old division in 2004. And that was just for starters. Tim Noonan scoring the game-winning goal against Brewster. Mr. Can't Stop the Funk, Jack Labby. Booth Hemingway as a lefty attackman, spinning inside and unleashing his upper corner shot. Ben Gamari giving the daily weather report. The weather today will be breakfast for lunch. Ben, there is a theme in this talk. John Lescure showing incredible versatility, going from the number one tennis position to a great support goalie for lacrosse. Coco Nichols playing La Gatana at Winterfest. Allison Munro scoring eight of the team's last 10 points in our win over Lexington Christian. Caroline Earls designing eye with her black and white portraits.
Caitlin Glover placing 19th in the 20 yard individual medley in the New England Swimming Championships. Ben Gamari again taking his SATs in a Winnicunnet Saturday detention hall. <laughs> Kelly Coughlin scoring a crucial goal against Beaver Country Day in the EIL tournament. Sarah Lundgren dancing the voice within at Winterfest. Jay Hayden joining soccer as a senior to take on the goalies duties. David Lapham trying to cheer up the headmaster on the senior run. How are you doing, Mr. Ridgeway? David gasped, I'm gasped, dying gasped. Well, Mr. Ridgeway, considering it's an hour run, dying's not a bad option. <laughs> and he was away in a cloud of dust. Jenna Martin, Tyler Jordan, and Gen Ben Gamari playing that last visit to their little brothers and sisters. Alex bushwhacking Mikhail in Assassin at the Dur Durham bus stop. Patrick Knowles scoring on a chapel at on Chapel Hill Chauncey Hall, I'm still not sure I believe this, from the midfield line. The memories of the members of the class of 2005 are also of quality and qualities. The speed of Chris Bolton hurtling off an icy face in that famous leopard skin outfit in a giant slalom race. The leadership of Jenna Martin with her very young softball team taking them to the championship of their bracket in the EIL tournament. Amber Bacco's smile, even two-thirds of the way, gasped, gasped, through a cross-country race. The courage and independence of Nina Morenci Broussard in taking on the challenges of a year of study abroad. Max Clement's strong forehand, which he kept hidden for so long from Mr. Sherbon. DeWitt Perkins' long ball in golf and baseball. The sheer determination of Jenny French as the number two cross country runner in New England and the 23rd backstroker in the New England Championships, Swimming Championship. The grace of Sam Smith with his, his incredible headers. The grace of Jackie Kimball dancing always something there at Senior Arts Night. And the grace and power of Derek launching one of his patented skying shots in lacrosse. The humor of Chris Pope cartooning with Seamus searches for and finds the meaning of life. And Olivia Cholak's humor and that unshaved leg. <laughs> you had to be there last night. <laughs> the class travels down the road of life with a move over we are coming through determination. It is a wonderful zest they have. Mikhail Mobius won a place as an Intel science finalist. Move over Richard Hawking. Ben Gamari running across campus, running the New England's and Tevas or some such sandal, and running the school as student body president. Move over President Bush. Olivia Cholak philosophized. Move over Confucius. Student government railroading through that blasted toaster. The class was on the move intellectually. Together it topped 1275 on the SATs and 11 members of the class were national merit qualifiers. Speaking of moving someone over, Andrew Arbuckle scored three goals against the number one ranked Worcester Academy. And Caroline Earle scored six points in 45 seconds on LCA. Matt Smith politicked and politicked and politicked. Move over Carl Rove. On senior trivia night, we learned Willis Taylor is still teed off about a ninth grade detention. <laughs> Move over and watch out, Mr. Downey. Jenny French, Emma Bobst, and Amy Gregg finished one, two, three in their cross country race at Bancroft. Move over indeed. David Lapham recycled, musical chairs and all. Move over Greenpeace. And on Thursday, the class of 2005, they don't know this yet, took on the challenge of the senior run and racked up 1,208 laps. Move over, class of 2004. I'm in trouble with one member of that class. <laughs> Members of the class constantly surprised us with the breadth of their talents and interests. Tyler Jordan played all of his sports physically with complete abandon, witness five concussions. And yet he was the gentlest of the gentle in the Big Brother program. 
Alex McKinney, master of the outside jump shot in basketball, offered us a nuanced rendition, a telling rendition of Hallelujah on Senior Arts Night. Rebecca Thorpe, hockey forward and lacrosse goalie, came out of nowhere to stun us with drops from Jupiter on Senior Arts Night. Ryan Sullivan joined basketball as a senior and became a stalwart defender. And to find that hockey exclusivity, our very own Blues Brothers Goon Squad, Evan McDonald and Andrew Arbuckle, cheered on the spring teams all through that wet season and cold season. Speaking of surprises, David Lapham, the shyest of the shy, four years ago, emerged as a scoring cross-country runner, a solo guitarist playing in my life at Woofstock, and as Percival Brown in The Boyfriend, sharing a duet with Amy as Madame Dubonnet Brown, performing You Don't Want to Play With Me Blues. Another characteristic of the class of 2005 may be the most telling, its camaraderie and its closeness. Olivia last night spoke of the class's constant displays of affection. Somehow we're going to have to get that into our handbook. Many of their stories have to do with members of the class working and playing and simply being together. It truly, truly is a class. Together, John Pelletier and novices Jack Bement, Allison Munro, and Mikhail Mobius wowed us in the mousetrap. Together, Booth Hemingway passed to Willis Taylor for a quick stick, skying shot against Hebron with four seconds left in the first half, and they went on to win that game. Together, Josh Rosenthal and John Lescure at baccalaureate, true believers, you and I. Together, the girls cross country team, Emma Box, Amber Bacco, Jenny French, Amy Gregg, Aaron Gilbert, Nina Morenci Brassard, Coco Nichols, Eliza Norcross, and Martina Burtis, Martine, I'm sorry, Burtis, ran on that cold and miserable and snowy November day to a New England cross country championship to add to their other two second places and first place over four years. Uh, they joined or led the New England Patriots, we're not sure of the order, in the establishment of those New England dynasties. Together, the boys team, led by Alex Caldwell, Ben Gamari, David Lapham, and Mike Roundtree, added to the cross country legacy with a second, third, and fifth place finish finishes in the New England championships. Together, Derek Bell and Josh Rosenthal, as first-year players, brought JV hockey back to life at Berwick. Together, Amy Grotta, Willa Ross, and Jenna Walsh enchanted us with their grace as members of Company Blue, dancing Don't Stop and This Train. Together, 10 members of the class pioneered an outreach community service trip to Guatemala last summer. Martine Burtis, Emma Box, Amy Gregg, Tyler Jordan, Caitlin Glover, Aaron Gilbert, Willa Ross, Ryan Sullivan, Sarah Fink, and Tim Noonan gave up the comforts of the summer seacoast living for two weeks to supply, clean, and paint a kindergarten school. Together, Olivia Cholak, Matt Smith, Chris Bolton, Tim Noonan, and Jack Bement decided that five heads were better than one and formed the Senate to lead the class. And lead they did from that toaster to the draft of an honor code. Together, James and Jack Labby. Mr. Sherbon said it all at the Spring Athletic Awards. Jack and James had our backs. And he was right. Jack and James had our backs, not just in tennis, but in basketball, in, in golf, and on the stage, and everywhere else. Together, behind the scenes, behind the curtains, supporting student performances. Christy Haskell, James and Jack, again. Parker Wattis, John Pelletier, Jack Bement, John Garrett, and Willow Ross took care of the lighting, the sound, the props, the sets, the makeup, and the stage management of our productions. Remember the snow falling, the light searching, and the screams in the mousetrap. Together, 11 members of the class were Bulldogs, 12 season athletes, the most ever in a class. Together, all of the members of the women's varsity athletic teams have won five straight independent league sportsmanship awards. I trust everyone is hearing that. The women of this class have been involved in four consecutive years of sportsman league sportsmanship awards. At the same time, the men joined that group this year. To think that this class won both the league uh, sportsmanship awards is truly remarkable. 
Now those awards are often associated with losing teams. Not so with these teams. The boys and girls this year had a 57% winning record. The boys soccer team won the co-championship of the Eastern Independent League. Cross country girls won the New England championship and boys placed third. Golf won second place in the EIL. Boys basketball, baseball, and lacrosse all earned New England tournament invitations and hockey came within one goal of doing the same thing. There you have it, winning teams grounded in the ethic of sportsmanship together. What a concept. And a late, a hot piece off the press, Wolfstock, Alex, Ryan, Evan, Andrew, Ben Gamari, who put this group together, Matt Smith, Coco, and James and Jack doing the devil went down to Georgia at Wolfstock together. Senior Arts Night may have been the single moment when the class and the quality and the togetherness of the class of 2005 were most clear. Almost 20 members of the class performed and most of the class attended. That is something that had never happened before. Rebecca Thorpe joined Kelly Coughlin and Brittany Reed in a great rendition of 20 Years From Now. James and Jack, John Garrett and Jay Hayden performed several of Jack's own compositions. Leapin' Llamas, Moody Moose, and Camel Caravan. Where do those names come from? Willow Ross and Amy Grotta offered us the Rainbow Connection, which might have served as a theme song for the evening and even for the senior year. Someday we'll find it, that Rainbow Connection, the lovers, the dreamers, and me. Senior Arts Night took us back to the togetherness, the classness of the class of 2005. One moment told the story for me. A member of the class, at the end of Coco Nichols' violin performance, shouted, and I think I have this right, Coco, you rock my world. And of course he was right. Coco has been a model showing us exactly what excellence is for the last four years and longer. She has rocked us. I will take the liberty, however, to suggest that the comment also fits the class. The class that night and all year has rocked our world on this hilltop. It has in incredible ways embodied the classic Greek liberal arts ideal of this academy. It is intellectually curious and accomplished. It is creative, artistic, theatrical, and musical. It is athletic. It is a class where values matter. With relatively small numbers, the class of 2005, to my mind, was the rainbow connection. It has left us wonderful memories. It has surprised us. It has pushed us. It has amused us. The class of 2005 rocked our world. Alex had it right that night. Hallelujah. Mr. Clement, Reverend Muse, Mr. Fletcher, trustees, families, and friends, colleagues, it gives me great pleasure to present the class of 2005, 55 Berwickian Strong, who rocked our world. Kyle Mobius joined us on the hilltop in the fall of 2001. He is a member of the National French Honor Society and the Cum Laude Society. He has pursued his love of sciences at the National Youth Leadership Forum on Technology, working at the Space Science Department at the University of New Hampshire, and as a semi-finalist in the Intel Science Ta Talent Search. The fall will find Mikhail attending Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute as a Rensselaer Medal Award winner. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the salutatorian of the class of 2005, Mikhail Mobius. see, can everyone hear me? Yes, good. Well, first off, I'd like to thank you for the pleasure of speaking in front of all of you today. Now, four years ago, the class of 2005 first came to the hilltop as yet another mostly timid group of freshmen, though the impending years of high school probably seemed like an unimaginably long stretch at that moment. I would have to say that 
it seems all too short in hindsight. And probably because the rigors of our education forced us to think at near light speeds. Okay, I'll spare you any more bad physics jokes. But on the topic of relativity, the year of our graduation also happens to coincide with the centennial of Einstein's wonder year, which I would view as a good omen for the future of our class and a reflection of the accomplishments that the class as a whole has already made during the, f the past four years. Back in 1905, Einstein published five separate papers on new and unique discoveries in the theories of physics. That year is known today to symbolize Einstein's genius and overarching accomplishments. For the class of 2005, all four years have been characterized by accomplishments crowned by our senior year. For all intents and purposes, we as a class have made our mark and symbolized what is great about Berwick Academy as a community and school. As I think back to the last four years, a number of first impressions and experiences come to mind, especially to those of us who are new to the school and our first year have prepared the upper school. It was granted a bit intimidating. For one, it seemed that it quickly became known as general consensus that Mr. Sullivan was by far the most intimidating teacher on the hilltop for freshmen, even for those of us who did not have him as a teacher. <laughs> and I can clearly remember the first time that I was singled out in front of the entire school by Miss Melhorn, the, the one freshman going to the main state math meet. And then she proceeded to interrogate me on my entire knowledge of mathematics that I had at the time. Of course, that was, mm, well, quite an experience, I have to say. Nevertheless, I think I can speak for everyone in our uh, class that it was truly not hard to fit in here at Berwick Academy. Now true, there were some quirks about the school that we had to get used to over our years here. For one, morning assemblies were quite a new experience for me. And I can still vaguely remember the first brain bowl that Mr. Fre Fletcher led in morning assembly, and probably more poignantly, Dave Aceto starting up games of polylopsicle. Now, I have to say that we probably all thought the game to be completely ridiculous at the time, and probably still do, but it quickly became known as a quite welcome uh, entertainment source during the early morning assemblies. But this was just the start of the great camaraderie between the rest of our school and this class. And of course, who could forget the good-natured competition between members of our class? I would have never expected the kind of academic competition started by my classmates, especially during the last two years. Naturally, this great learning environment would not have been the same without a number of incredible teachers that we had here at our school and had the pleasure of learning from. For me, of course, Madame Clinton for several years of French, Mr. Sanborn for chemistry, Miss Melhorn for calculus, and a number who I can't all name during this short time. Well, the senior assassin probably uh, was the pinnacle of competition between our class and probably left many of us permanently paranoid to leave our houses. <laughs> but now, to move on from reminiscing about the past Let's go on to look ahead to where we are going after commencement. Are we not ready to move on to the next step in our lives? We've been privileged with an incredible education at Berwick Academy and should make the most of it to enact positive change in the world wherever we end up going during the coming years. Although we have learned much and have, abun have had abundant experiences over the past four years, we are far from done learning in our lifetimes. We have gained knowledge, and more importantly, we have been taught to continue our quest for knowledge and to never stop questioning. As Einstein said, imagination is far more important than knowledge. And I would say this is true, since with imagination we can continue to further the, knowl the knowledge we already possess and move ourselves and society forwards. True. By, mov by moving on to new things and using our imagination and creativity, we will run into difficulties and make mistakes. And yes, I know this seems unacceptable to a number of perfectionists I know. But then again, 
how else can we keep life interesting? Besides, as Einstein wisely said, anyone who has never made a mistake has never tried anything new. Sure, there will be times when we will stumble and have to take a step back to figure out how to best continue, but I am confident that we've learned what we need to get through these times. Always remember that you have to keep your inquisitive nature endowed upon you by your education alive. And on that note, I will leave you with one last thought from Einstein. The important thing is to not stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. Thank you, Mikhail. The, co the commencement speaker whoops, for the class of 2005 needs no introduction on this hilltop. In all he does, Mr. Fletcher brings honor to the profession of teaching and great gifts to his students, his colleagues, and his school. His, single one, his one single moment of questionable judgment was as head of the history department, allowing me to rejoin the department. Mr. Fletcher knows this class as few do. It gives me great pleasure to welcome him as a commencement speaker for the class of 2005, Mr. Bradley Fletcher. Uh, thank you, but I actually want to apologize because anyone having to make me sit through a speech today needs to apologize. Um, and when they asked me to do this, and I think the danger of asking any teacher to do it is that you're immediately stymied about what to say. We've been yammering at these people for years. What could we possibly say to them now? They're not going to take notes. There's no quiz or test at the end of it, although that was tempting. <laughs> and what would I tell them? Traditionally, a speaker offers a bit of wisdom that their education hasn't gotten around to. And it's got to be succinct, because remember, they're not taking notes. So I thought about it, actually, for a really long time. And I whittled it down. And here it is, single sentence. This is the best. Never hot glue yourself to anything with a propeller. <laughs> I know, I was surprised, too. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I tried to come up with other things, but every time I did, I thought, you know, it doesn't beat the propeller thing. That is really true. And if you don't get it yet, think about the kind of things that have propellers. No, just work it out. And, um, and if you still don't get it, try it. <laughs> See, you don't think it's very good advice, but you're not going to do it, are you? So there. Well, the biggest problem I actually had with that little gem was it's just way too succinct to get a speech out of. So I needed something more. And I had two ideas. Uh, the first one was uh, to fall back on a, a love of uh, those lovely little Zen Buddhist stories called koans, three of which I think speak very directly to what we're doing here today. And the other one was to uh, solicit my colleagues and the students and the faculty and staff of this school for their advice. And in the end, I decided to do both, which is what I'm really apologizing for. One of them would have been a really nice little speech. Two of them almost certainly is going to be brutal. So let's talk about that. About the uh, wisdom. Uh, I got several hundred pieces of it, not from everyone, but I ended up with, I think, a 10-page packet that I've got a copy of for everybody who's here. So if your wisdom didn't make it into this speech, it's going to pr almost certainly make it out to them in the form of a handout. Um, I guess, to be fair, what I ought to do is start with a sampling of stuff I didn't really decide to use, either because it didn't fit what I wanted to do, or because I didn't get it, or because, frankly, it wasn't very good. But maybe it'll work for you. That's why I feel like I need to offer you some. Uh, I, I wanted originality, so I overlooked the tried and true quotes, those lo lovely things like dance like no one is watching, sing like no one is listening. Uh, there was another, you don't remember days, you remember moments. And a third, if you can't sleep, count your blessings instead of sheep. I know they're sincere because that last one was from my seventh grade daughter who's an insomniac. So. <laughs> Uh, I also got this from a sixth grader. Get out there and make some money. 
which is actually pretty good advice, but it didn't work for me. Uh, another sixth grader, don't forget how to spell your name. It will come in handy. <laughs> A seventh grader offered this. Don't mouth off to the wrong people. Your parents aren't there to save you, Tyler. <laughs> that was from Caitlin. Uh, eighth grade offered us these kind of gems. There's a 30% chance it's already raining. <laughs> Commit five good jokes to memory. They will come in useful to you someday. Color coordinate. <laughs> Never be mean to anybody. They may end up famous and successful. <laughs> and this, if you can't spot the sucker in the first half hour at the table, you are the sucker. <laughs> this is obviously a fan of the current poker craze. Upper schoolers chimed in with, too much is not enough. And don't take life too seriously or you'll never get out alive. And I am way too smart to include any of my colleagues' advice in this category. <laughs> the most practically minded people thought in the shortest terms, ending high school and going on to college. First graders offered this, be ready for hard spelling tests. <laughs> and always be ready for more math problems. Math is a particular concern for fourth graders. One wrote, if you have a calculator, you should practice using the numbers you don't know yet. <laughs> and this first grade gem, which I think speaks very well for Mr. Hawes, you don't want to go to the principal because you'll probably have a meaner one than you do now. <laughs> a fourth grader reminds you, these are fine. And a fourth grade classmate says, never touch a hot stove and don't toilet paper other dorms. <laughs> a practically minded eighth grader said, always wear sandals in the dorm shower. <laughs> and a colleague of mine urged you to take the professor, not the course. Find the great teachers at your school. Another colleague wanted to remind you of Linda Greenlaw's advice from this very stage. Study what you want and don't worry how you will use your education. The act itself is too valuable to ever be wasted. My friend, the estimable Mr. Sherbon, I think agrees with the sentiment, but takes a harder look at the details when he tells you to unlearn as quickly as you can half of what school has taught you. And two former students, both now in their first year of college, checked in to say, it is really true. College is what you make it. Well, on that note, I want to talk about my first koan. These are these lovely little puzzles uh, that sort of challenge us, and they don't make sense. They are nonsense, not in the, f the way that we mean foolish, but nonsense which for them, for Zen Buddhist, is the uh, truest glimpse into the nature of reality and the highest wisdom. A monk posed this problem to Chinese Zen master Nansen. A man had a goose stuck in a jar. From earliest life, when it was small, the goose made the jar its home, retreating and sleeping there. But then came a day when it had grown just a bit too large to get out. He loved the goose and didn't want to harm it. The jar itself was very valuable. So the monk asked Nansen, how would you free the goose? The Zen master thought for a moment and clapped his hands and said, it is out. Now that's a heck of a story. And I have no idea what it means. <laughs> but I will offer you a few ways that I think it relates to us here today. Uh, most literally, you are the goose, and this place is the jar. You have been here since you were small or smaller. You have had been passing in and out of this place easily, but as you grew over time, it became more and more difficult. The jar has not grown, so stop blaming the jar. It can't grow. You're the one who's been making trouble with your growth. Some of you barely squeezed in and out this year. Others could only get an appendage back in by the end of the thing. But the time has come now when you've got to go. Or like the goose, you're going to get stuck. Everybody knows this. It's striking to me that all the advice assumed you would go. Even our youngest friends, none of them envisioned that you would stay here. Although one second grader uh, uh, offered this very sagely. When asked the question of what is the most important thing about graduating from high school, he said uh, that you know enough and are smart enough to go on with your life. If you're not, you should have another year of high school. <laughs> but assuming that's not the case for anyone here today, I think there is actually a deeper meaning to the koan, and that is about the nature of freedom. Graduation is a kind of freedom, isn't it? 
And really, for the first time in your life to this point, you're experiencing some measure of real freedom. It is limited and incomplete, to be sure. It always will be. It should be. Few, and I dare say none of us, could really handle complete freedom. This is freedom as it really is, with obligations and responsibility. The delicious, impulsive possibilities and misuses of your freedom occurred to many of the smallest members of our community. The daycare kid said this about graduation and going to college. Be helpful and nice, and no hitting your friends with strollers. <laughs> Don't be naughty. No biting or screaming or kissing. <laughs> no throwing drinks. And then someone thought better of it and said, do all your homework and you can kiss, but don't spit. <laughs> First graders added, remember not to jump on the couch and do not climb on the counters. They really are just hairless chimpanzees, aren't they? <laughs> what these children struggle to understand, what the goose never could, what you must, is that freedom is not a physical state, it's a mental one. Nansen is telling the man in us that the greatest one in danger of being trapped is not the goose, it's the man who owns the jar. If you are worried about that goose in the jar, you are as trapped as it is. It is not about free or unfree, in and out, good or bad, right and wrong. Those are limited and false dichotomies that actually do restrict our freedom. The difference between a refuge and a prison, as the goose perhaps has learned, is really just a state of mind. It's all in how you see it and understand it, perceive it, and use it. It is what we make it. As fourth grader Ben Clapp put it in a neat, tight script, as straightforward and plain as his words, you are free and it is your choice about what you want to do. So you will choose and you will leave and next category will bring you to life beyond the school and the advice that goes with that. Asked what they thought you really need to know when you graduate from high school, second grader said, math and driving. <laughs> and another said, math and the basics of life. Others of their classmates urged you to take time outside. And one said, get farm animals. <laughs> the more worldly third graders were far more cautious. Don't pickpocket. <laughs> Don't break the law. Don't do dangerous stuff. Don't eat out of date food. <laughs> and another wants you to take a shower. And another said, write a novel. An eighth grader takes his approach to life this way. If your goal is a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, first you get your bread, then you get your peanut butter, then you get your jelly. Put them together because you need all of them to completely achieve your goal. I guess that means to approach things in a methodical manner. A less systematic classmate made this simple recommendation, sing every day. I like to think that that person had an only slightly more prosaic soulmate in the upper school who wrote, everyone needs to have one good pair of shoes. It is in that pair of good shoes that we go to all the best places. Most upper schoolers, however, were less poetic, offering things like, life's a hole, dig it, <laughs> and stay off the train tracks, and life is rough, wear a helmet. Faculty, too, weighed in heavily on life advice, hoard change. I asked what they meant. They said, you always need more quarters. <laughs> Avoid short-term, low-interest credit cards. They are trapped said Mr. Connolly. <laughs> Mrs. Ramsey said, there is no elevator to success. You've got to take the stairs. Someone, I don't know who, said, don't stop reading. And Mr. Libby offered three simple guidelines for life. Marry the right person, start saving early for retirement, and family is the most important thing you will ever have. These sentiments about family were widespread across the divisions in years. Call your mom and dad and tell them you're okay. Visit your family. Give your family a great big hug. Always thank your family. Not surprisingly, another popular theme about life was life as the journey. A third grader, my son, said, don't go down the wrong path like Anakin. <laughs> and a classmate echoed, follow your own path. A fifth grader quoted the Tao. 
All journeys begin with a single step. And another urged you to go where there is no trail. A third said, happiness is a way of travel, not a destination. And an eighth grader quoted Robert Frost, take the road less traveled by. Mercer Smith, also in eighth grade, offered this. If you encounter difficulty, don't change your decision to go, change your direction to get there. A colleague says to look to the road ahead, and Adele Tibbetts just wants you to travel widely. My second koan is a short story about Joshua Stone Bridge. According to commentary with the story, there were three great bridges in China, and a man decided he would travel to see all three. Parenthetically, I think what we got here is a theme vacation, which I recommend. I don't know what the first two bridges were, but as the Chinese invented the suspension bridge, I suspect they were large, well-constructed engineering marvels worth a visit to gaze in awe at. But the third bridge, Zen Master Zhou Shu's, was simply a set of rough stepping stones placed haphazardly across a stream. The man stood and gazed at it in obvious puzzlement, and Zhou Shu approached him and said, you don't see the bridge, do you? It allows horses to cross and donkeys to cross. Well, if life is a journey, then the traveler in the koan is forced to ask, just what is a bridge? We encounter them all the time. We take them very much at gra for granted. How many did you cross to get here this morning? I suspect none of us could quickly say. And how do we judge a bridge? By the manner in which it supports us and allows us unimpeded to continue on our travel? But maybe the great bridge, maybe Joshua's bridge, is to be judged by how it challenges us, how it forces us to slow down, even stop, rearrange and repack our baggage, the material and the mental, take stock of our direction, perhaps even reassess the journey itself. We could use some of that after all, couldn't we? We find ourselves running more errands than are necessary. And we are all on journeys that we didn't intend or choose and don't fully understand. Bridges are transition points. Bridges, if we see them, as the Zen master tells us, will slow us down and ask us who we are and where we are. And where is it truly that you want to go? We are at one of those bridges this morning, aren't we? And bridges are also connections. It is no wonder that a number of adults spoke to that point, and they were all adults who saw, talked about bridges in life. Over and over, there was don't burn your bridges, build your bridges, tend your bridges, and be bridges. We are all travelers together on a long and winding journey full of obstacles and rivers to cross. Stop often, admire the bridges you encounter, be kind and generous to fellow travelers, and don't be surprised when you meet them or find yourself recrossing the same bridges again years down the road. The last category of advice, and the rarest, I believe, and the best wisdom, speaks to the inner being. A third grader wrote this, get rid of all your buttons so no one can push them. <laughs> I gotta find that kid and ask how you do that. <laughs> Fourth graders were beautifully terse. Be truthful, listen well, believe in peace, apologize. Eighth graders offered this, stay honest. And another, don't take things too seriously, but know how to be serious when it's necessary. And live here, now. My colleague said, remain teachable. Listen to life. And when the truth hurts, that is precisely the time that you must pay attention to what the truth is saying. As you reach for the sky, remember the tallest tree has the deepest roots. And for Charlene Hoyt, the message is spiritual. No God, K-N-O-W, no peace. No God, N-O, no peace. It is that simple. Louise Gadipe chose the refrain of a song. When you get the choice to sit it out or dance, I hope you dance. The last koan, and I'm almost at the end actually, is the most straightforward, and yet I think it does speak to the inner being. It is a number of my students' favorite. I know it's Olivia's favorite. And it concerns a man one morning walking to market who is suddenly chased by a tiger. 
and he runs in panic and desperation, but the tiger is, of course, faster. And he comes to the edge of a cliff, and the tiger is right behind him, and he leaps off the cliff, and halfway down, he grabs onto a branch of a tree that's growing out of the side of the cliff. And he's hanging there looking up at the tiger just out of reach, swiping at him and growling, trying to get him. And then he hears a noise and looks down below, and there's another tiger pacing back and forth, growling and trying to swipe at him. And while he's hanging there in the balance, he happens to note slightly off to the side there is a little strawberry plant growing out of the side of the cliff and a single perfect berry growing from it. And he reaches out and he plucks it and he pops it into his mouth and he thinks that it is the sweetest strawberry he has ever tasted. My friends, the world is full of tigers. Only a cynic or a fool would ever tell you otherwise. Most of them, and the most dangerous ones, are not yellow with black stripes. You can't avoid them, and you shouldn't try, and you can't blame them for their hunger. It may well be that in some cosmic balance, as our friend knows hanging there, that the sweetness of strawberries is directly proportional to the sharpness of a tiger's tooth. What we need to do then is to have the presence of mind and maintain the healthiness of perspective to be joyful, live richly, be just and kind, and find beauty even among tigers. Understand the Buddha taught that the world is perfect. Strange as it seems, he is right. We do not see it because we are not awake to the possibility. It is because we worry too much about geese and jars. We do not stop long enough at bridges. We are terrified of tigers and we don't get enough strawberries. We do not long enough ponder the good advice that is given or even that we give. So let me leave you with a bit of advice. The lower schooler said you should be proud you're graduating and do your best. Remember BA and be nice to your roommate. A fourth grader knows that you will make lots of changes in your lives, but he or she says, I hope Berwick Academy has made changes in your mind and your heart. Middle schoolers want you to guard your reputation as your most valuable asset. Try your hardest, make good choices, but have fun and keep dancing. Upper schoolers encourage you to remember them, laugh, and always have some form of protection. And my colleagues remind you, <laughs> my colleagues remind you to be thoughtful, make good choices, and get involved. And know that you go from here today with the great bounty of all the well wishes that could come with their wisdom. Thank you. And I also know of one family and two grandparents who have supported 13 grandchildren at Berwick, have amassed a total of 97 Berwick years. Makes all of us parents think a little differently about this. I wonder I, if Chris Polk's grandparents, Geraldine and Bob Sylvester, could stand up. <laughs> Theirs truly is a Berwick story. The beating heart of any school is its faculty. Last year we were introduced in sad circumstances to a poem which spoke of teachers true, of teachers true. Would the faculty, teachers true, please stand to be recognized? And it is now my honor to recognize in particular two members of the faculty. The Dorothy Green Outstanding Teaching Award goes to a woman who brings incredible energy, warmth, support, and excitement to her classroom. She truly leaves nothing on the table. And someday I will win that darn math warm-up exercise. The 2005 Dorothy Green Award goes to Charlene Hood.
The good part of that is we get to look forward to her giving a speech to the trustees and faculty in January. She can start working on it, but don't start with one of those math puzzles. The Jimmy Dean Good School Person Award recognizes a woman who combines great talents in the classroom with incredible energy, creativity, and generosity outside the classroom. In particular, she has taken an already powerful theater program to the next level. It's my pleasure to recognize Liz Ann Flagg with the Jimmy Dean Award. Now we're, we're going off program very briefly, but I, I hope you will enjoy this. We have amongst us, sitting over by Jefferson, a Berwickian, a teacher of many years on this hilltop, but she is now retired. She wrote the Academy's history, which went to the 12 stalwarts last night. She is the namesake of the new award picked by the faculty, that name, uh, which Ben Gamari received last night. And she was, like a number of you last night, academic award winners. Her story, as she was in fact the valedictorian of her class, her story took a different, different and difficult turn at that point. She was accepted at UNH, but she could not afford the tuition. To help her pay for her first year's tuition, she sold her academic medal. You see, then it was made of gold. In those days, that was very valuable and it paid a good deal of her tuition. Marie never got the medal back and we thought this was a good time to right that wrong. In case any of you are wondering, I think Marie could still teach an English class. She is always teaching me. And it is now my privilege and honor to thank one other person. Whew. Gasp, gasp. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck Clement has been involved with the Academy for nearly two decades. He has served on the Board of Trustees for 16 years, and he has been the President of the Board for the last five years. Serving with Chuck has been both a professional and personal honor. The story is too long to be told here, but you must know that the revitalization of this campus started with Chuck's commitment to the middle school and continued with his commitment to all of our facilities and to all of our programs. When he saw something needing to be done, whether it was a lower school playground or a women's hockey program or a science center, he led the charge. He also managed to be a great friend to this head of school, meaning he could offer not just kind support, but also wise and critical counsel. It is my pleasure to read the dedication as voted by the Executive Committee of the Board of Trustees. Whereas he served on the Board of Trustees from 1989 to 2005, whereas for students and teachers alike, he led the building of high quality facilities and the creation of the best possible setting for learning and teaching. Whereas he always placed the interest of this academy first and foremost. Whereas he gave generously, even sacrificially, of his own time and resources. Whereas as president of the board, he led the academy with an abiding commitment both to the common good and to each and every individual. The Board of Trustees of Berwick Academy on June 11, 2005, awards the Founders Medal to Chuck Clement.
Thank you very, very much. I, again, I, I, uh, I certainly am envious of two or three groups out here. The group in the shade over there, I am tremendously envious of. I am wonderfully envious of the class in front of me, but I, the one thing I'm not envious is having to follow Mr. Fletcher. <laughs> However, wonderful, as always, a wonderful, I've had the pleasure of listening to two of his graduation and they're spectacular. So under those apologies and on the understanding that um, I'm a Tilton grad and I apologize for that, I'll do the best I can. <laughs> Mr. Ridgway, Reverend Muse, fellow trustees, faculty, parents, families, and friends in the class of 2005. I am honored to receive this Founders Medal. As I look back at past recipients, I am truly humbled to be included in a group that has made such a difference at our school. It was my great pleasure to join the Berwick community over 19 years ago, as you'll find happened, I didn't compare notes on a couple of these. I served as an overseer and joined the Board of Trustees 16 years ago. In fact, my first trustee meeting was Mr. Ridgway's first trustee meeting. As I look back, I think uh, both of us, I think as I look over here, particularly we have a few more gray hairs. I don't know which cause from either of us, but uh, together we, we share a lot now. As I look around campus today, there are so many wonderful, wonderful facilities, the Jefferson Science Center, the Jackson Library, just to name a few. One of my earliest memories was arriving opening day with our son Chuck, who I think is over in the shade there, at the brand new Kendall Lower School. It was a wonderful facility, but budget constraints didn't allow for a playground going way back in those days. Jeff Taylor, whose son Willis is graduating here, getting his diploma today, came to the rescue. Painting some old used pipe and purchasing three tire swings, we now had, albeit small, a playground. But Jeff being the way he was, and for some of you that came through lower school, knowing that he was kind of like the Pied Piper of the lower school, he wasn't satisfied with that. He took it, and by the following fall, we had a small Disney World down there with pirate ships and everything abounding. As I recall Jeff saying, he said, seeing the excitement in the eyes of those lower schoolers as they pulled up in the bus and ran to all the uh, parts of the new playground made all that work worthwhile. Thankfully, stories like these have been repeated so many times in my past 19 years. Hard to believe, 19. And what a difference they all have made. My fondest memory was in 94, being able to dedicate the new middle school in my parents' name. A year earlier, I had received an, a luncheon invitation, as a matter of fact, from Hap and Skip Kendall. Needless to say, it turned out to be the most expensive club sandwich I have ever eaten. <laughs> and still nibbling on a few, but yes. But I recall my closing remarks that day by quoting Winston Churchill, and I think Hap gave this one to me, and he's a good guy like that. We make a living by what we do, but we make a life by what we give. In true BA style, over 70 others are included on the donor plaque in that middle school great room. And that was just the beginning, as Hap mentioned. While our campus has grown, a building is just a building. And without the talented and tireless efforts of the faculty and staff, it would be just a building. Thank you to the faculty and staff for being a friend over all these many years and including the impact that you made not only on myself, but on my two, uh, two children and family. Thank you. To Hap, and I, I didn't know if he thought he was going to get away without this, but uh, and you thought you were, but no. Uh, thank you for your leadership and dedication. When people ask me, you know, why, why are you around after 19 years? A lot of them, uh, and I honestly will tell them that there is many reasons, one of which is out here today. There's no greater treat than spending a year as a trustee in meetings thinking that this is the culmination. It is, it is truly, a, a, as I, I've said, it's a present that I give myself by having uh, these young men and women out here. It truly is. But the other part of that is, the other compelling reason is, is Hap's passion to make BA a better place. And to myself and so many others, that has truly been infectious. Thank you. <coughs> hold the tears, hold the tears. <coughs> Last but not least, I want to congratulate the class of 2005 for this is your day. I wish you the best. I'm going to kind of share a couple of quotes, not anywhere near as good as Mr. Fletcher's, but first by C. Hoppy. 
I hope that my achievements in life shall be these, that I will have fought for what was right and fair, that I will have risked for that which mattered, and that I will have given help to those who were in need, and I will have left the earth a better place for what I've done and who I've been. And as Confucius say, wherever you go, go with all your heart. Thank you very much. It is now my honor to ask Mr. Clement to help in the presentation of the diplomas. Mr. Clement and members of the Board of Trustees, it is my happy duty to present on behalf of the faculty, the class of 2005. And Andrew's got to do this first and get it right so everybody can follow. Andrew Arbuckle. Derek Kyle Bell. John Bartram Bement the Third. Emma Elizabeth Botts. Amber Baco. Christopher Bolton. Kelsey L. Burke. Martine Eliza Burtis. <laughs> James Alexander Caldwell. Olivia Ann Cholak. Kelly Elizabeth Coglin. Caroline Wallace Earl. Sarah Chase Byam Fink.
Jenny Brooks French. Benjamin David Gamari on the run. <laughs> Caitlin Mira Glover. Amelia Irene Grata. <laughs> Amy Beth Gregg. Jonathan Corey Garrett. Aaron Marie Gilbert. Christina Dean Haskell. J. G. Hayden the third. Booth O. Hemingway. <laughs> Michael Tyler Jordan. Jacqueline Rye Kimball. <laughs> Maximilian Clement. Patrick Owen Knowles. <laughs> Jack Andrea Labby. James Anthony Labby. <laughs> David Alexander Lapham.
John Mater Lasphere the Fourth. Sarah Margarita Lundgren. Evan Michael Scott McDonald. Jenna Lee Martin. <laughs> Alex Russell McKinney. Kyle Mobius. <laughs> Nina Morenci Brassard. Allison Jeanette Monroe. <laughs> Catherine Morton Nichols. Timothy Joseph Noonan. <laughs> Eliza Stein Norcross. John Frederick Pelletier. DeWitt Page Perkins. Christopher Andrew Pope.
Brittany Justina Reed. Joshua William Rosenthal. Willow Elizabeth Ross. Michael Timothy Roundtree. Matthew Hamilton Smith. Samuel Smith. Ryan B. Sullivan. Willis P. Taylor. Rebecca Lorette Thorpe. Parker James Wattis. And the last member of the class, Jenna Walsh. The Cogswell Medal is awarded to the Academy's valedictorian. As most of you now know, the class of 2005 is no ordinary class. Being its ranking scholar is a remarkable accomplishment. Amy Gregg is a member of the Cum Laude Society and the National Spanish Honor Society. Amy has been a central part of the success of the girls cross country team and those New England championships. Next fall, we'll find Amy attending Dartmouth College. It is my present to present the Cogswell Medal winner and the valedictorian of the class of 2004, Amy Gray. Five!
Good morning, everyone. Okay. <laughs> the world needs more laughter. Laughter is defined as the biological reaction of humans to moments or occasions of humor or an outward expression of amusement. Laughter comes in many forms, such as giggles, clicks, chortles, chuckles, hoots, cackles, sniggers, and guffaws. Laughter is so important because it brings people together and bonds them in an intimate way. Most of our favorite memories of Berwick are of times when we have laughed together, in class, in assembly, at lunch, in the pit, sitting out on fog fields, or on the bus ride home after a game. Some such memories include watching Ben's The Daily Show, um, seeing the freshmen lose at Rainbow, um, playing Math Chase in Mr. Hoyt's class, uh, cheering on the varsity players as they battled it out against the teachers at the pep rally, um, rating the bachelors on Olivia's dating game, uh, watching David try to make Mr. Davy laugh. Does anyone remember that? <laughs> um, he, it didn't work. He didn't laugh. <laughs> Um, uh, dissecting a squid in biology, that was pretty interesting. Um, enjoying Christian and Ian's dance performances. Uh, hearing Tyler's voice echoing across campus uh, pretty much all the time. And then watching our hypnotized classmates search for a secret phone, which was actually a shoe in the audience when hypnosis came. Um, in all of these moments when we've laughed together, we have come together as a community, a strong, vibrant, and fun community of teachers and students. Laughter makes us come alive and it brings out the best in people. It calms the mind, relaxes the body, and gives us a sense of belonging. Laughter is used as a signal for being part of a group. It signals acceptance and positive interactions. Pro cultural anthropologist Mahadev Apte says, laughter occurs when people are comfortable with one another when they feel open and free. And the more laughter is, there is, the more bonding occurs within the group. Based on this statement, Berwick must be a very close community. And we are. We are supportive, caring, and fun. And our laughter strengthens our relationships and makes us happier and more balanced people. Laughter also improves health and well-being because it triggers the release of endorphins. Studies have shown that laughter on a regular basis can both boost the immune system and improve cardiovascular health. Hearty laughter, hearty laughter reduces stress and can be as relaxing as deep meditation. Laughter is good not only for the individual, but also for the group because it is often contagious. The award for the most contagious of laughs goes to Brittany Reed, followed by Kelly Coughlin. Their laughter outbreaks daily burst forth in calculus class and quickly spread mayhem throughout the room. Thanks to both of you for all the fun you allowed us to have this year. Some of my uh, favorite people know how to laugh and do so often. They laugh loudly and freely and they improve the mood of all those around them. We all know these types of people. They make others feel comfortable and included and they're fun. What if we all made an effort to keep a sense of humor and to remember how often we laughed as children? How much lighter would we feel? Recently, a, seven a seven-year-old boy at my mom's elementary school was talking with one of his teachers about kindergarten memories. He asked her if she'd had the same teacher for kindergarten that he'd had. His teacher replied that she had not. She was, in fact, older than his teacher. The little boy responded by saying, oh, I can tell you're old. And she said, how do you know? His reply was quick and honest. Your hair is gray and your face is crumbly. Yeah, pretty honest. Uh, anyways, a sense of humor is essential for a healthy life. If you can't laugh at the absurdities of life, you must not be fully living. When your entire being is fully awake and engaged, it is possible to find humor in all aspects of life. Take Seinfeld, for example. Some people say that it's a show about nothing. It's really a show about life, and that's why it's funny. Life is bizarre. Wonderful, yes, but also mysterious and often surprising and incomprehensible. Enjoy it. I urge you to be the one who lights up a room with laughter and um, creates and brings people together. Oopsies. 
<laughs> um, thank you. Um, <laughs> Okay, to create accepting and fun community. <laughs> I just you okay, okay. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay. Uh, Berwick is a very special place comprised of wonderful faculty, staff, and students. Our seriousness of purpose and dedication to academics, arts, and athletics are exemplary. But this excellence is not what unites us. Smiles and laughter unite us, and they will continue to do so here and wherever we go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amy. We're nearing the end. After the recessional, the class of 2005 will form a receiving line back arcing behind us in front of the library. We encourage you to use that opportunity to congratulate individual members of, of the, this remarkable class. You're also invited to a light buffet in the commons. Thank you all for helping to honor and celebrate the class of 2005. Could we all join one final time in recognizing and applauding the class? Reverend Muse is trying to get me to learn these signals, so we all need to sit down one more time. Reverend Muse will deliver the benediction. Please remain seated during the final march so that all can view the class of 2005 as it departs for the last time. Reverend Muse. Mr. Fletcher, a few years ago, Brother Blue was here. And he had lots of advice, which he spoke about. But what you didn't hear was what he said to the students as they came across the stage up here. And to every young man, he said, don't worry your mother. <laughs> and he said to every young woman, be a good girl. I'm not saying that. I'm saying have a happy life. I've shared with you some of the most well-known and best-loved words from the prophet Micah. And there is another prophet whose words you should aim to achieve your whole lives through if you wish to make a difference in this world. The prophet Amos said that what God desires of us is this, to let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Religion complicates God. God's charge to us has always been about love, justice, and righteousness. Eugene Peterson's translation of Amos's prophecy is this, I want justice, oceans of it. I want fairness, rivers of it. That's what I want. That's all I want. As you all go on your way, be a great blessing to all of humanity. Bring love, demand justice, and practice fairness to all. God has given these gifts to you. In gratitude, I urge you to go and do likewise. May God bless you. Amen.